Good afternoon, and many thanks to Lucy and the After All team for inviting me to participate in this conference, and to Kate and Eleanor for making all the logistical arrangements. I've been asked to speak today about uh, the social dimension of artist-run spaces in the UK in the 1990s, so I'll start with something of a visual anecdote. One day in 1996, I took my camera around London to photograph some of the artist-run spaces that had erupted. Everywhere that the recession had left an empty industrial or retail unit, an artist group seemed poised to occupy it. Uh, let me see, that's, um, this is something called the Galerette in Club Row, which was the site of Donald Parsnip's Daily Journal. <coughs> this is Plummet in Clerkenwell, in a tower block there. This is a space called Annexed, a highly branded space in a now unthinkable empty unit in Hoxton Square. This is Underwood Street, where at number 30 there were artist studios, and at number 34 here there was a space called Dog, where this group, Bank, uh, saw out their final days, curating these strange tableaux, zombie golf here. This is the entrance to Poster Studio in Charing Cross Road. Uh, south of the river, this is Beaconsfield, and this was City Racing. Um, in fact, there were so many projects of this kind being hosted by artists at the time that when hans Ulrich Abris curated an exhibition called Life Live at the Museum of Modern Art in Paris in 1996, it was necessary for him to acknowledge the unprecedented upsurge of artist-run galleries. Eight of the artist groups were invited to curate exhibitions for the museum, and this anthology described 50 artist-led initiatives, which was produced to accompany the main exhibition catalogue. And the reason I was taking all these photographs was to give to an artist, a little known then artist based in Glasgow called David Shrigley, so that he could produce the drawing here for the cover. <coughs> Uh, and I have to admit that at the time I was so surprised at how little it resembled my photographs that I, I didn't actually realise it's actually quite geographically correct, so the, the, the galleries were. <laughs> <laughs> so two of the artist-run galleries that were invited to exhibit in the museum in Paris, Transmission and City Racing, Transmission being in Glasgow and City Racing, the, the space in Vauxhall that I just showed you, were later immortalised in their own publications which documented their individual histories and is some kind of testament to the longevity and the stature of these two spaces. So I'd like to consider them in a bit more detail here before moving on to a, a more explicit consideration of the social dimension of their activities. So if we, can, if we compare the two spaces, Transmission was founded in 1983 and it's still running today, whereas City Racing um, was founded in 19, 1988 and, and closed 10 years later. Transmission continues to be run by a committee of at least five people who change every two years with overlaps in between, um, and they operate according to a membership structure whereby um, all the membership's very active and comes together for an AGM um, that sort of uh, scrutinises the decisions of the committee members of the preceding year. By contrast, City Racing ran uh, with the same five committee members for the, the whole ten years of its history, these were John Burgess, Pete Owen, Keith Coventry, Paul Noble, and Matt Hale. And they had no kind of scrutiny from membership. But what they lacked in democratic accountability to a membership was comp compensated for by some kind of makeshift democracy in their programming, which basically meant that when they had committee meetings in the local pub, if um, one member of the committee failed to be convinced by an exhibition proposal, it wouldn't go ahead. But if everybody could agree on a particular exhibition, it would go ahead with the full support of the committee and the artists were then very much um, encouraged to do what they wanted in the space. Conversely, at transmission, no kind of democratic consensus has ever been required. And if a single committee member feels strongly enough, then an exhibition will go ahead and similarly achieve the support of the whole committee. Um, at the time of Transmission's opening, its press release articulated a hope for, and I quote, reciprocal relationships with other galleries with the intention of introducing young artists to more established galleries in Great Britain. By this they meant publicly funded galleries, and Transmission played an important part in a triangle of galleries in, in Glasgow, which included the Third Eye Centre, which is now the Centre of Contemporary Arts, and Tramway, both of which are still running in Glasgow. City Racing, on the other hand, expressed a desire for independence from established galleries and career trajectories. Yet by looking at the visitors' book for their first exhibition, you can see that, um, that it was very much known about by people working within the public sector with representatives from both the South Bank Centre and the ICA attending the first show. What this desire for autonomy actually translated as was freedom from commercial galleries. And in an attempt to both consolidate and unravel their own mythology, City Racing described the experience of standing outside a commercial gallery at somebody else's opening. And I quote from their book, 
whilst drinking the drinks, showing your face, standing outside on the pavement, making up the numbers in someone else's scene. It hits you. This gallery will never show your work. This gallery has nothing to do with you. You've got nothing to do with this gallery. The recogni recognition of these truths is critical. On the pavement, you realize that you are surrounded by your own scene. There's only so much room inside, but the good thing is that outside, the space is unlimited. Reflecting back on an exhibition they made with Seal Floyer in 1996 after she'd been signed by the Listen Gallery, City Racing mused that we should have been very happy to be working in tandem, if only for a month, with such a prestigious and historically important gallery as the Listen. It's the sort of association that could be used to lever one's gallery up a notch in the art machine's power structure. We cannot say that we rejected this position because we did not recognize it to reject it as we were fixed on the process of making one-off projects for City Racing's invited artists. The time we spent at the gallery was for them and them alone. We did not want to be subcontracted technicians for some commercial gallery. So while Keith Coventry and later Paul Noble, two of the committee members, were to be represented by commercial galleries during their time at City Racing, and while Anthony Reynolds and Maureen Paley, two important gallerists in London, were frequent visitors to the gallery, and Carsten Schubert, another private gallerist, hosted a fundraiser for City Racing. This attitude led the committee to focus on artists without commercial representation, with the further exceptions of Mike, uh, Michael Landy and Mark Wallinger. The same anti-commercial position was generally taken by transmission for the first 15 years of its existence. In a 1993 essay, Grant Kester comments on the position taken by many artist-run galleries in relation to the market. And I'm quoting from his essay here. Within the rhetoric of the artist space movement, artists seem to believe that by rejecting market values, they would effortlessly sh shed their own cultural privilege and operate in a utopian, state-funded, mini-public sphere founded on sweat equity and collectivity. But the withdrawal from the elitist art market into a non-profit enclave doesn't necessarily bring the artist any closer to various segments of the non-art public nor does it allow artists to transcend their own class and cultural privilege. The empowering gesture of artistic, artistic self-determination tended to gloss over the very real schisms between the artist and society at large. This schism between art and the social is at the heart of today's discussion, and we'll see how it's borne out in the, t in the case of these two artist-run spaces. It's important to understand the context of the cities that we're talking about at the time. When Transmission opened in 1993, it was in the Glasgow of Red Clydeside, a city of huge poverty and inequality, of mass unemployment in the shipbuilding industry, and the highest rate of infant mortality in the UK, a city of workers' struggles in which class consciousness remains acute. This was reflected in the literature of the time by writers frequenting Transmission like Alistair Gray, James Kelman, and Tom Leonard, whose work was imbued with a, a mixture of national pride and despair and who harbored a deep skepticism about the hierarchical relationships that maintained class, power, and bourgeois institutions. Within visual art, the new image painting that emerged in Glasgow in the, the early 1980s also reflected these concerns, albeit in a very stylized way. But while this small group of painters would achieve commercial success, no private galleries existed to represent the kind of post-conceptual work being made by the young artists who coalesced around transmission. By contrast, City Racing opened in uh, Thatcher's London in 1998, a city with a very well-established, if a little depressed, art market. A now infamous generation of artists were graduating from Goldsmiths College and organizing a series of exhibitions in this space, building one in the Docklands, at the dawn of a new cycle of prosperity. And while City Racing noted that postmodernism had made it both easy and fashionable to be without ideology, and that content and meaning were not trusted anymore, in Glasgow, content and meaning had not yet gone out of style. And the department known as Environmental Art at this School of Art in Glasgow, uh, the, the department being in established in 1986, strongly reiterated the artist placement group emphasis on the context of artworks. And an ideological bridge was built between the, the department, the Environmental Art Department, and transmission by the second committee which meant that a, a, a generation of artists graduating from environmental art arrived at transmission with an understanding of local history and politics and a practice that included work outside conventional galleries. One final point about context that's perhaps worth making is that there were affinities between the two galleries we're talking about and certain magazines. In the case of transmission, the long-standing and discursive Edinburgh Review had an influence on early committee members, 
amongst whom Malcolm Dixon would go on to establish Variant magazine as a vehicle for critical great creative discourse which retained strong links with transmission, while in London, City Racing Committee member Matt Hale worked with Art Scribe and then Art Monthly. In terms of funding, Transmission and City Racing were established on precarious economic grounds. Transmission was given a rent-free space by Glasgow City Council and matching funding of around £2,000 by the Scottish Arts Council. Added to this, it could rely on modest uh, annual subscriptions of its members of around £5 per person and organised an annual, uh, sorry, not an annual, one-off auction of, of members' artworks to raise funds. Beyond this, there were no public funding, funding streams appropriate to the kind of work they were undertaking. And former, former Transmission Committee member Christine Borland describes how the gallery faced two equally untenable options for, in, for increasing their funding. The first one of these would have been to bid for some kind of incentive funding, which relied on demonstrating that the gallery was able to generate its own income through the sale of art and craft trinkets. And the second would have been to succumb to a desire on the part of the Scottish Arts Council for Transmission to appoint a paid administrator as a, as a kind of constant face within a constantly shifting organisation, which would have compromised the, the kind of participatory nature of the gallery by introducing a hierarchical division of labour. And so it was that the gallery had to wait until 1990, seven years after it was established, before its funding was increased to £12,000 a year. The first four years of City Racing's existence were funded by the committee, which divided every expense equally between themselves. In February 1992, they mounted an exhibition by Sarah Lucas from which Charles Saatchi bought three works for £3,000, with the gallery taking 10% commission. And the following month, the private gallerist Carsten Schubert hosted a fundraiser for the gallery which raised in excess of £1,000. <coughs> Having previously had an exhibition for funding to the Greater London Arts Association turned down, the committee decided to apply to its newly formed replacement to the London Arts Board. And having only asked for around £5,000, they were quite surprised to receive an offer of £10,000 per year, which was later extended over three years and then a further two years. Both before and after these higher level fund levels of funding were secured, both spaces ran on amity and goodwill. Goodwill because the resources were often scarce, and especially in the early days, the two galleries largely ran on an economy of favours. And amity between, because the exhibitors quickly be became friends if they weren't already, and were consistently referred to by their first names in all the exhibition publicity materials, disarming the presumed distance that museums uh, tend to operate. Added to this, both spaces shared a focus on living artists, with City Racing describing how their interest was, and I quote, in art that was a living thing made by living artists. We like to have a direct working relationship with artists. We were not interested in the commodity of art at all. This is why we happily supported every show we did, be it good or bad, because it didn't really matter to us about goodness or badness. We just wanted to see what the artists could, could and would do with our help. <coughs> with a few exceptions, notably Eric Troncy at uh, City Racing, the personnel of both galleries curated their own exhibitions. From the outset, Transmission stated that work would be selected on the basis of quality, energy and intent, while Andrew Wilson found that City Racing's strategy didn't go much further than showing the work they wanted to show. As we'll see when we consider the, the exhibition histories of the two spaces in a little bit more detail in a minute, Transmission initially erred towards thematic group exhibitions, while City Racing tended towards solo or uh, two-person exhibitions. And while Transmission existed to represent a broad constituency of artists with no other outlet for their work, City Racing was set up to exhibit the work specifically of its committee members. And we see here that a card from 1990 showing five exhibitions in succession by each of the committee members. This was later expanded to include artists that they felt weren't being represented anywhere else in London. Thinking about the different, different ways of working between the two spaces, City Racing acknowledged that they were aware of the different aesthetics, attitudes and practices between us and transmission and refer to their own comparatively idiosyncratic approach. But there was a synergy of spirit between the two spaces which was reflected in their exchange in 1992. And Ross Sinclair, who was invited to, by transmission to exhibit at City Racing as part of this exchange between the two galleries, writes that and I quote, both transmission and city racing were founded on a similar desire to just get out there, get out there and show your work with people you respect in circumstances of which you are in complete control. These galleries survive by providing a sympathetic context for artists where, where there's time and space, although usually not much money, to try out new ideas. There's a freedom to experiment with different forms, different approaches, installation, for example, 
Fundamentally, though, a context is created where market pressures need only intrude if desired. End quote. Again, this desire to hold the market in abeyance in the name of artistic freedom reflects Grant Kester's observation, yet the extent to which this implies the social is still unclear. If we look a bit more closely at the two histories of the spaces, the similarities and the differences will become more evident. And I'm afraid, Renata, this approach, this is very historical, it coincides much more with the, the first method described by Deleuze of revisiting a past event. Um, and I need to go back in order to do this to consider some exhibitions of which I, I didn't attend, as, as uh, Claire Bishop mentioned as a, as a problem. But um, the history is such that it's kind of in public ownership now, and I don't feel too guilty about doing this. So uh, <laughs> trans when Transmission opened in 1983, it was in a small shop unit in a rundown part of the eastern edge of the city, which is now hugely fashionable. And it was maintained by the, or rather it was motivated by the same kind of desperation and urgency that Doug described in his talk this morning. Um, having dealt with various sewage leaks and rats in the basement, the first committee stood down to be replaced in its in entirety. The early years of the gallery were very explicitly political. So, for example, in 1984, the exhibition Winning Hearts and Minds took its name from the slogan used by the American government to justify the presence of troops in Vietnam, which had been reappropriated by Michael Heseltine in a campaign against the CND. There was an exhibition by British situationist Ralph Rumney, a performance by Stuart Brisley called Red Army 2 and an acknowledgement of the polemical power of art as reflected in the subtitle of the exhibition Iconoclasm, Art from the War of Ideas. In 1998, transmission, sorry, 1988, uh, transmission moved to new premises where it remains today, although it's been assimilated into a Shishi New Arts Centre called Trongate 103. In the same year, <clears throat> the Freeze exhibition was hosted by Damien Hurst and his colleagues at Building One, and City Racing opened. Behind the commercial facade of the betting shop, there lurked a domestic interior, which since 1983 had been the squatted home of two of the five committee members. As we've seen, for the next few years, the city racers mainly exhibited their own work. Meanwhile, in 1990, Glasgow became the capital, European capital of culture and embarked on its mission to convert the post-industrial city into a tourist destination. A group called Workers City was set up to investigate City Council funding priorities and attempts to sell off Glasgow's parks and as other assets. They used their creative skills to publicly question much of the reasoning behind the presentation of Glasgow as a tame, pristine city posturing before would-be inward investors. Transmission invited the group to use the gallery as their headquarters, which the following year gave rise to an exhibition by Ewan Sutherland and Ross Sinclair and a review written by James Kelman. In the early 1990s, the committee included our environmental art graduates Douglas Gordon and Christine Borland, whose names would go on to appear in the Listen Gallery roster and the Turner Prize shortlist. They and their contemporaries were much more mobile than their predecessors and travelled extensively in Europe and the US, generating enthusiasm for Glasgow and the homegrown artistic community. This contextually aware generation perpetuated the, the text-based tradition of the gallery while reinvigorating performative strategies and rediscovering <coughs> male art they invited the godfather of U.S. conceptualism, Lawrence Wiener, to exhibit at Transmission, and he made a wall-based text which seemed to allude to the architectural construction of the surrounding tenements in a statement that was replicated on stickers to be di di excuse me, distributed through Variant magazine. In 1992, as we've already seen, three important things happened at City Racing. Charles Saatchi bought works from Sarah Lucas's exhibition, three of these kind of newspaper works, Carsten Schubert organised a fundraiser in his gallery and the London Arts Board offered them funding, all of which dr drastically improved the financial situation of, of the gallery. Having proposed to stage the exhibition of other artists as part of their grant application, the committee consciously stop, decided to shop, stop showing their work at home. That's the City Racing um, Committee. They'd always shown their own work up until then, but they decided to stop hosting exhibitions of their own work in the gallery. The first beneficiaries of this decision were Transmission, and Transmission sent four of their artists to London, while the City Racing Committee, perhaps predictably, curated themselves into an exhibition at Transmission. <laughs> In the years that followed, City Racing continued to offer exhibitions to artists whose names are now familiar. That's Michael Landy's exhibition there, while Transmission exhibited work that became less directly political or didactic. <clears throat> 
An exhibition by Stefan Geck, for example, was a lyrical allusion to the nuclear submarines operating out of the nearby Fast Lane naval base with bells made out of the steel from decommissioned subs, although you'd never know this from looking at them. Contrary to the kind of projects that Claire described, these were very much space-bound, quite conventional exhibitions. And by the mid-1990s, a new direction was evident in the space. By virtue of a committee including Will Bradley, who I believe is here today, and Toby Webster, who together with Charles Escher would go on to open the Modern Institute, the first gallery in Glasgow prepared to represent the kind of contemporary work coming out of transmission. The exhibition New Rose Hotel was typical of the new retro-futurist ethos of the era. It prioritised formal concerns in art, architecture, design and fashion with a liberal sprinkling of cafe culture and music while seeming to question the failed utopianism of the modernist project. In 1996 came the Life Live exhibition that I've already mentioned which invited the artist-run spaces into the museum in, in Paris. And by 1998 the game was up Artist-run spaces had been institutionalised and there was much more competition for scant funding. After 10 years, City Racing closes its doors with, you've guessed it, an exhibition by the committee. And as one, as one door closed, another opened. With, that's the exhibition by the committee. As one door closed, another opened with the Modern Institute in Glasgow, injecting a hitherto unknown commercialism into the Glasgow scene, the effects of which are still being felt today. And while Transmission responded with a group exhibition that saw Ralph Rumney being invited back to exhibit alongside Adbusters and a screening of Manufacturing Consent, a film about Noam Chomsky and the media, the gallery began to feel the impact of the market. This led to pressure from the Scottish Arts Council for Transmission to participate in art fairs, including the one in Glasgow and more recently the Freeze Art Fair in London, and for them to increase the commission that they charged to exhibiting artists. In the text I've already quoted from by Grant Kester, he comments on a description of artist-run spaces from the, by the National Endowment for the Arts in the US, which, and I quote from Kester, evokes Im images of a virile, aggressive, bohemian avant-garde, bare-knuckled artists literally ripping a space for themselves out of the fabric of the decaying metropolis as a re refuge from a banal and indifferent <coughs> art market. As it turned out, the bohemia conjured up was largely populated by white middle-class artists, and their ripped-out ripped spaces, at least those that survived, would, within the next decade, become well-established and, in some cases, even well-funded venues, often located in the midst of extremely valuable, revitalizing downtown neighborhoods. Further, the alternative scene, far from rejecting the art market, would come to function as a highly effective farm team system for the commercial sector, with, art, with selected artists being called up periodically to exhibit in the big, big leagues." End quote. Parts of this statement certainly seem to fit with both transmission and city racing in relation to the composition of their committees, their positions in now gentrified parts of their respective cities, and the feeder system in operation between artist-run galleries in the market. So what do we mean when we talk about art and the social in the context of artist-run spaces? In the first instance, the social nature of these spaces was immediately obvious, and this is a rather unflattering photograph of three of the uh, city racing committee members at one of their own openings. Venturing into an opening of an exhibition at City Racing on a Sunday evening was to squeeze into a social scene on a narrow domestic staircase. There's also a safety in numbers that comes with collective activity, and the committee confesses that none of us would have even considered running a gallery on our own, but as a collective we found the strength to do it. And again, as mentioned by Doug, this collectivity and inclusivity was extended to other artists and artist groups. Similarly, transmission has always operated as a nexus for social activities, for parties, readings, performances and screenings. Beyond this, as we've seen, the artists involved with the gallery, certainly from the mid-1980s to the early 1990s, had an acute awareness of the socio-political issues surrounding them, and this led successive committees to offer refuge to groups like Workers' City, as we saw, which were dealing directly with more pertinent local issues. The City Racing Committee members were also involved in two local social struggles that affected them directly. At the time that the gallery was being established, three committee members, Pete, Paul and Matt, were living in Leytonstone and had become involved in the campaign to stop the building of the M11 road link, which threatened to destroy several streets worth of Victorian housing. As they put it, their tactics involved tackling councils, governments, security guards, bailiffs, press, and the infuriating indifference of Leytonstone residents who would have to live with the consequences of the motorway once built. Paul Noble made an artwork addressing the plight of the blighted houses, a parody of national heritage plaques, which was appended to various facades in the neighbourhood. 
This moment of history coincided with the formation of City Racing and the DIY attitude found its way into the gallery. Secondly, John and Keith, who shared their home with the gallery, were very much involved in the struggle to keep possession of the squats that constituted Oval Mansions, which had been condemned by Vauxhall Council in the late 1970s. And although though John eventually won the right to keep his home that the gallery was housed in, they've since confessed to little effort being made to engage their non-art neighbours. And I quote, The mansions, that's Oval Mansions, attracted all sorts of people. There were those with drug-related problems, mental health problems, liberty problems, and no problems. You name it, the mansions house at least one of each of these types. There were some of the people who could have been City Racing's audience, but were not. Somehow they were kept away. Matt, Pete, and Paul did not live at the mansions, so they they really didn't know any of them. But stories about them were passed on by John and Keith. The impression was given that we were innocents waiting to be devoured by the flesh-eating zombies that occupied the rest of the mansions. City racing was sanctuary only so long as they were kept out. This was utter nonsense, of course. The truth was John and Keith were paranoid about the co-op finding out that Block 8 was not solely being used as a living space and thus having new flatmates thrust upon them. End quote. Underlying this facetious description is a certain acknowledgement of the eternal separation between art and life that the the avant-garde still struggles to bridge. Again, uh, Grant Kester writes of how in its quest for autonomy from the art market from government interference and from consumer culture. Quote, the artist-run space has functioned to buttress the autonomy of the alternative arts sector at the same time that it has provided a site largely insulated from direct political and economic market pressures within which a critical aesthetic discourse could take root. Yet ultimately, this same insulation has mitigated the ability of artist organisations to develop a strong public constituency outside the alternative arts community itself. In other words, the very autonomy that shielded artists from from commercial pressures and conferred upon them the the artistic freedom deprived them of any audiences beyond their immediate constituency. And so it may be said, as Andrew Wilson has done, that both galleries created and fed on a community of visual ideas, but their audiences have rarely moved beyond (coughs) their own narrow constituencies of fellow artists. By way of addressing this point, I'd like to conclude today with an observation that I hope will feed into our discussions. As Stefan mentioned, I've just returned from Cuba, where I was undertaking research into cultural policy that was formed after the 1959 revolution. One major initiative was the scheme to train thousands of art teachers. Schools were set up all over Cuba, which were, this is a quote from a book, which were available to all, regardless of social class, From 1961, instructors were trained intensively, usually by leading artists and musicians and often in prestigious commandeered buildings. By 1963, the first graduates were working in local schools and factories, targeting the young, and by 1969, there were some 20,000 instructors with an inevitable momentum. The movement popularized culture in more effective ways than decrees or reforms, culturally empowering those hitherto lacking any opportunity to develop an artistic talent, and becoming an explicitly participatory experience, bridging the potential divide between the personal and the collective. End quote. An official report from 1979 cites an initial 40,000 young people being offered scholarships to undertake the two year training course, which enabled them to promote the various forms of artistic expression in previously utterly ne- neglected rural areas. Through this system, this official report outlines. Large sectors of the population have had the opportunity to receive instruction in the different forms of artistic expression. It has served to enrich the non-material aspects of people's lives and given rise to a movement of amateur artists which has produced many artists of considerable talent. In 1964, an estimated 1,000 amateur groups existed. By 1975, this number had swollen to 18,000. That's 18,000 groups, not individuals, with a particular focus being on the activities of children. In its heyday, there were an estimated one million amateur artists, or aficionados as they were known, in a population of around seven million people. This movement of art instructors and amateur artists spawned by their tutelage provided a parallel structure of art education, the aim of which was to open communication between artists and the public to facilitate access to art, art education and art production on the broadest base. It was particularly aimed at workers with the middle schools and the Superior Art Institute of which this is an aerial view, offering courses in the evening to accommodate those working during the day, or week-long courses for which people continue to be permitted time away from work to attend. In 
and through this programme a large proportion of the population has been able to take part in, in cultural production as producers rather than mere consumers as part of a serious practical attempt to reconcile the gap between art and society. Thank you very much.